Hello, everybody. My name is Pablo Wojcikowski. I'm a faculty member at Northwestern University and director of the Center for Latinx Digital Media. Thank you so much for joining us for today's weekly virtual seminar of the Center. It is really a pleasure to have you with us. The mission of the Center is to create knowledge about digital media in Latinx and Latin America communities across the Americas. Today's speaker is a leading scholar in this space. Professor Celeste Bustamante de Gonzalez directs the Center for Border and Global Journalism at the University of Arizona School of Journalism and is also affiliated with the University of Arizona Center for Latin American Studies. Esteban Vila Turek, a graduate student at Northwestern University and an affiliate at the Center for Latinx Digital Media, will introduce Celeste in just a minute. I am delighted to note that this quarter, the series is co-sponsored by the Alice Kaplan Institute for the Humanities, the Buffett Institute for Global Affairs, the Center for Global Culture and Communication, the Department of Communication Studies, the Department of Radio, Television and Film, the Latina and Latino Studies Program, and the Program in Latin American and Caribbean Studies. But before we go to the seminar, I would like to start by acknowledging that Northwestern is a community of learners situated within a network of historical and contemporary relationships with Native American tribes, communities, parents, students, and alumni. It is also in close proximity to an urban Native American community in Chicago and near several tribes in the Midwest. The Northwestern campus sits on the traditional homelands of the people of the Council of the Three Fires, the Ojibwe, Potawatomi, and Orawa, as well as the Menominee, Miami, and Ho-Chunk nations. It was also a site of trade, travel, gathering, and healing for more than a dozen other native tribes, and is still home to over 100,000 tribal members in the state of Illinois. It is within Northwestern's responsibility as an academic institution to disseminate knowledge about native peoples and the institution's history with them. Consistent with the university's commitment to diversity and inclusion, Northwestern works towards building relationships with Native American communities through academic pursuits, partnerships, historical recognitions, community service, and enrollment efforts. Let me say briefly a little bit more about how the seminar will unfold. First, Esteban will tell us more about Celeste's research and career in just one minute. Then Celeste will deliver her seminar. After that, we will open for questions. Please enter your questions in the Q&A function of the webinar at any point in time. Esteban will moderate. At the end, we will deliver some closing remarks. Once again, many thanks for joining us. And without further ado, Esteban, the screen is all yours. Thank you, Pablo, and welcome everyone to today's seminar. It is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Celeste Gonzalez de Bustamante. She is a professor in the School of Journalism at the University of Arizona with a dual courtesy appointment of the University of Arizona Center for Latin American Studies. She is a University of Arizona Distinguished 1885 Scholar and an affiliated faculty member of the Mexican American Studies Department, History and the Graduate Program in Human Rights Practice. Dr. Gonzalez de Bustamante directs the Center for Border and Global Journalism, and her research interests include historical and contemporary issues related to media in the U.S.-Mexico borderlands, Mexico, and other parts of Latin America among publications spanning several book chapters and peer-reviewed journal articles in prominent journalism academic outlets. She is also lead author of Surviving Mexico, Resistance and Resilience Among Journalists in the 21st Century, author of Muy Buenas Noches, Mexico Television and the Cold War, and co-editor of Arizona Firestorm, Global Immigration Realities, National Media and Provincial Politics. Prior to entering academia, she worked as a journalist for 15 years in commercial and public television. She is the current chair of the elected standing committee of the Association for Education in Journalism and Mass Communication and the co-head of the Border Journalism Network. Professor Gonzalez de Bustamante, thank you for being here and welcome. The screen is yours. Thank you so much, Esteban, for that nice introduction, uh, generous introduction. Thank you. And thank you, Center for Latinx Digital Media for inviting me to be part of this amazing series. It's such a contribution and I'm just honored to be here. Thank you, Dr. Boskowski for uh, inviting me. And so I am, so uh, it's a pleasure to be able to, to share my research with you. 
and this research specifically that I worked on with my dear colleague at the University of Arizona, Dr. Janine Relly. So I'm going to share my screen now. And hopefully that's working and you can see my screen. And I'm going to talk mostly about um, the book that we just had published, Surviving Mexico, Resistance and Resilience Among Journalists uh, in the 21st Century. And this work really, I will give you a little bit of background, is the culmination of a decade of work, we started working on this, hard to believe that 10 years has already gone by, looking really at what was happening with journalists in the border region, the US-Mexico border region. We're in Tucson, the University of Arizona is in Tucson, and it's an hour's drive to the border. And so uh, both myself and my colleague Janine really have worked in Mexico as journalists and we had been keeping an eye on what was happening there. And of course, then we both went into academia and started to do research on journalism in journalism studies. So we were very interested to see that the number of journalists who were being killed in the borderlands was, was starting to increase. And I'll get into exactly when that was starting to happen, but definitely was happening uh, and increasing by some, um, you know, dramatically around 2010, 2011, when we started our research and we wanted to see, well, why is that happening? And how then are journalists trying to confront this horrible situation and what steps were they taking and how is basically journalism practice changing? So we had this great idea of, well, let's, um, you know, we wanted to do a survey, but we realized that, that that was not going to happen because of the very risky situation that journalists around the country were facing. So we tried another methodology that I had used in other work uh, coming up with um, oral histories. And we, we went through the entire 2000, mile US-Mexico border and interviewed journalists on both sides of the border two times, once in 2011, 2012, and then um, 2013, 2014. And then also we moved our research and expanded to other regions of the country because we noticed, and I'll get to, to that point in a little bit more in just a minute, we noticed how the violence was shifting to other parts of the country and that was impacting journalists and journalists were then being killed in many other parts of, of the country, unfortunately. So that was what we did and, and leading up to the book, we've had at, at least three peer reviewed um, uh, journal art, um, chapters for uh, academic journal articles and, um, and then this monograph that looked at networks and then uh, this finally the book. So a little bit of context about what's happening in Mexico since really we started this research um, almost maybe probably around 2015, a journalist a month has, has been killed in, in Mexico. Imagine that it's uh, 12 journalists a, a year that we had thought, and this is why we had to continue this research, we had thought that when a new administration came in, that maybe the violence against journalists in Mexico would decline somewhat, but that is, has not been the case. This has continued throughout the past decade and it's getting worse in some states and more than a, a, one journalist a day is being attacked in, in Mexico now. And that's just the reports that they have. Some of, the, of these attacks, of course, are not even reported. Most of the journalists are being killed on what we consider to be the periphery of the country. And I'll go into that a little bit more in detail in a bit. And uh, we like to note that this is definitely a historic problem that dates back. Journalists around the world, of course, are being targeted when people who are in power don't want 
the certain information to get to to be released to the public and that has been a historical problem in Mexico in particular but we saw in the early 2000s that the number of deaths and types of attacks that journalists were were receiving increased and were becoming much more severe and serious and then throughout the 20th century and into the 21st century impunity has been a real problem a sticky what we would call a sticky issue that has not been able to be addressed despite many of the things that have uh, happened in terms of legal measures uh, impunity continues to be a major factor in the fact in why journalists are being killed and we don't know exactly even who's behind many of the the killings because of this problem of impunity so here's a good map of mexico that shows just between 2000 and 2020 um, more than 100 journalists being killed in the country. And you see in these northern states, journalists, all northern states, journalists have been killed. And some of the most difficult states for journalists in terms of the deaths uh, have been Chihuahua, that's the state below Texas. Well, all of these states, Chihuahua, Coahuila, Nuevo Leon, and Tamaulipas are all below Texas. Texas is a big state. And then Tamaulipas, is one of the most difficult states. These would be all on what we would consider the periphery. In Veracruz, 20, uh, 27 journalists were killed during that time period. And that is a state that we would consider to be on what we call the extreme periphery. And if there, we, we could talk about that more if there's time in the, in the Q&A part. And then you see on the Western side of the country, Guerrero, Oaxaca, are very difficult states for journalists as well, where 13 journalists killed in Guerrero, in Oaxaca, thir uh, 13 journalists have been killed as, there as well. And here's a little bit more about the context. Certainly the problem of violence against journalists has to do with organized crime and not just organized crime, but the changing nature of organized crime. So since um, Felipe Calderon launched an all out drug war, um, a, a war on the, on the drug cartels, the number of journalists killed have, has increased. So you see um, these major cartels in different parts of the country, the Sinaloa cartel, um, really kind of controlling the Western states and the Beltran Leva organization kind of controlling Sinaloa, but of course the Sinaloa cartel is there as well. And that's a point that I wanted to make about this particular map is this is a sort of a bird's eye view, aerial view of the cartels that are operating where there are other studies that sh show that many, there are more than one um, you know, groups, cartels working in these and operating in these different states. And that has been a difficult situation for journalists if the different cartels are, are shifting all the time and they're fractionalizing as they are in Mexico, then journalists have a difficult time trying to figure out what the rules are. And they've even come out and said that in so many words in their different publications. You know, what are the rules? Uh, tell us what the rules are, you know, to the supposed um, ex, uh, the, um, ex, the supposed authorities beyond those people who are um, in power, legally in power, right? So here, our, our overarching question is um, that, in the context of increasing violence toward the profession in Mexico, how did journalists, journalists survive and persist? And, and then we are operating with these two definitions that really started to come out of the research, which is a qualitative study. Um, I'm a historian and my colleague Janine Relly is a political scientist and uh, she works a lot in public policy. So we bring both of those 
disciplines to our work, which I think really helps us to look at this issue much more deeply. So we use this, this definition for resistance being conscious acts to individually and collectively oppose adverse and threatening conditions with the intent to improve safety, professional autonomy, and the field as a whole. And there's a relationship between resistance and resilience we have found, and that resilience we see as the ability to continue to function professionally and to create and adapt and resist the, in the face of trauma and violence. So the methods that we used over the course of uh, the 10 years was historical research, doing oral histories. These oral histories, by the way, are in a, an open access digital archive called the Documented Border. If you just were to Google the Documented Border at the University of Arizona Library, you'd be able to find it. So a lot of these interviews that we did, uh, we consider to be oral histories. And so you'll be able to access those at, by going to that website if you are interested. And we did in-depth, in semi-structured um, and qualitative interviews. These are at the, the initial round of interviews that we did. And we did textual analyses and network analyses, looking at how these different groups of journalists are working together to try to create um, collective action together. So just this is like, you know, quickly going over some of the findings that came out of this study. Um, we found that, that there were very many ways uh, that journalists, a huge diverse diversity in terms of the type of resistance that they were, um, ways that they were trying to push back against the violence and the circumstances in which they were having to work. And there is also a typology of re resilience in that. And we identified many different types of networks from professional networks among journalists to even networks of uh, uh, personal networks, professional networks, educational networks, even academics in some cases were part of these, um, part of these networks. Um, non-governmental organization networks on the local, regional, and international, national and international level. So I would just like to go through um, a few of these examples that we have in terms of categories of resistance, which as you see here, as I mentioned, there's just a vast number of them. And we distinguish the resistance between what we would call everyday forms of resistance to extraordinary forms of resistance. So if you're familiar with James Scott's work, that's sort of where the everyday forms of resistance comes out of in terms of how people try to resist very oppressive work, workplace situations. And the extraordinary level of uh, resistance, that's something that we're bringing to this research. That's something that we're contributing. And so we see in the professional level um, and personal level that journalists pretty much in all parts of the country and uh, in terms of those people who are included in our study are have gone to self-censoring to protect themselves, to protect their families and sources. And they have uh, in many ways tried to come up with personal safety protocols. In the extraordinary realm, they, uh, you know, an extreme form of resistance would be having to leave the country to work. And that means um, that there are dozens of journalists living outside of the country in the United States, in Canada, in. Uh, Europe, and some of them actually have gone to Mexico City because as I mentioned, we're looking at the periphery where most of the journalists are being killed. And so they go to Mexico City as a, as a way to get away from the very dangerous situation in which they're working in the peripheral zones. And then there are all kinds of 
different everyday and extraordinary forms of um, repertorial practice related changes to um, equipment and technology where you would have maybe on the everyday level you they might be using whatsapp instead of text messages because they might consider that to be a little bit more safe versus you know on the extraordinary level would be wearing a bulletproof vest so what what's the difference between everyday and extraordinary everyday forms of resistance would be something that is um, not really changing the practice in a, in a huge way that that is uh, on the everyday, if you will, if the um, ordinary, and then something like bulletproof vests that had been something very unprecedented in changing the newsroom or practice in a in a dramatic, much more dramatic way. That's how we distinguish between everyday and extraordinary measures. Uh, one thing I want to touch upon because I'm going to talk about this a little bit later is this cross media collaboration. So every, an everyday form of that would be, you know, calling in and checking on colleagues and families and sometimes traveling in in groups to to crime to crime scenes. And that's something that journalists have been doing uh, for the past decade. That was something very new. And then uh, on the extraordinary level would be uh, sharing reporting with other news organizations and sometimes sharing their reporting with news organizations on the other side of the border, sending stories and information north where publications in the United States could possibly report on that and publish it. And then it would be safer for a news organization in Mexico to publish that same information. So I touched upon these networks of journalists that have been formed. This is this has been one of, I guess, if you were to say what is a positive thing that has come out of this in all of the different ways that journalists have changed their practice. I would say one thing that possibly has come out of it that has been positive and we talk about this in the book is that um, in some cases journalism the quality of journalism has improved because there's more training um, of journalists and so they're actually being they have more training in terms of ethical practices and part of that is connected to these journalism networks that have been created such as the Juarez Journalists Network, the Red de Periodistas de Juarez. And here are some of the, the members of that group. In uh, 2019, they would often, and they still continue to do this, get together to call out the government and this, this sort of system systemic problem of um, impunity. And in this particular case, they're calling attention to the, to the death of Miroslava Breach when Lucea, who was killed in 2019. Her case is one of the few cases actually that was quote unquote solved. Somebody was actually arrested and convicted to 50 years in prison. But this is a typical uh, way that these networks are trying to make more visible what's going on in Mexico and providing all kinds of training and in some cases through the training improving journalism in Mexico. Um, here are the, some of the, the four out of the five women who created this network and that's another interesting finding actually is that in a lot of these networks, not all, but in many of the networks there are a, the people who establish the networks are, are women. So in this case, the Red de Periodistas de Juarez, or uh, going from left to right here, are um, Lucy Sosa, Rocio Gallegos, Aralí Castañón, and Sandra Rodríguez, who is now um, head editor at El Diario de Juarez. All of these women worked at El Diario de Juarez for um, a period of time at least, and that's how they got to know each other. 
And also what has helped these women is they were part of a program that was sponsored by their news outlet in which they were able to get a master's degree in journalism at uh, the University of Texas El Paso or another institution in the United States. And that is not to say that because they studied in the United States, they became better journalists, but they were able to get a master's degree and that helped them to uh, gain a higher level of skill and understanding of how journalism works. But at the same time, you know, nothing could really prepare them for what they were about to, to, um, to experience in a city like Juarez that did at some point become the most dangerous city in, in the country. And so I wanted to just highlight this particular network. There are, there are dozens of other networks in Mexico, this is one of the, the first state, um, and I would say this Juarez Journalist Network, even though it's based in, in Ciudad Juarez, has become a statewide organization. Uh, and it's been looked at by other networks that have formed in other parts of the country. So that's why I highlight this one, but there are really, in all of the border states right now, there are journalist networks. Uh, there's a uh, Red de Sonora, uh, Periodistas de Sonora in Baja California. There's a Northwest, uh, <clears throat> Northwest Journalist Organization, and I'm, I'm sorry, Northeast Journalist Organization. So this is a, another positive thing that's, that's come out of all of the violence and the Juarez Journalist Network, along with uh, Mexico City-based network, uh, Periodistas de a Pie, uh, has, has helped to create some of um, this solidarity among journalists, which at the beginning of our study was uh, one of the laments of many journalists. They were talking about the fact that, that there was not a lot of solidarity among journalists and that was making things very difficult for them. Then by the end of the decade, uh, we were hearing much more different things. So that is another reason I'm glad that we stuck with this um, particular topic and area of research so that we can see some of the change that has happened over time. So we, there's a section in the book we, at the beginning, um, I think one of the main points that we wanted to make in the book was that certainly too many journalists have been killed, um, but Mexican journalism is far from dead. And in fact, in some cases it's actually improving. And so I want to, I'm going to play a video in just a second, but uh, I think that that's an important thing to keep in mind not to detract from the horrible violence, but also to see that journalists are doing what they can. They're not being silenced in every part of the country, which has been some of the criticism um, early on, I think, but there's a lot of evidence that journalists are actually continuing to do their work. The landscape has completely transformed in terms of the way that they do their work, but they, are still trying to do it in many different types of ways and innovating. Um, and um, we can talk more about that in the, in the Q&A section uh, or session. And so I'm gonna stop my sharing and, or, well, here's my Twitter handle if you um, want to follow me. And again, I just wanna say thank you for, um, for the invitation. And I'm going to play a video here uh, that highlights the network that I was talking about. So I'm going to stop there, but I want to say another form of resistance that is indicative of uh, the journalists with whom we, we spoke with is actually publishing. And so the Juarez Journalist Network, at, when they were, you know, in their first, um, they were, they were formed in 2011, their first five years or so, they were focusing on training. And then by, um, let me plug myself back in here. By 2018, Rocio Gallegos, who had been a lead editor at El Diario, 
quit um, El Diario after decades of work there and created La Verdad. It's an online publication in, which focuses on investigative journalism. And that has been a sort of the publication arm, if you will, of uh, La Red de Periodistas de Juarez, the Juarez Journalist Network. So that's another form, yet just yet another form of, of resistance. And many of these networks have publications and they also are, are collaborating together and working together and from different states. And that's another uh, positive thing that we're seeing in terms of um, and reaction to and resistance to the dire situation in Mexico and with respect to freedom of expression. So I'm going to end there. I said I was only going to talk for a half an hour and I think I'm almost there. And so we can turn it back over to Esteban. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Gonzalez de Bustamante. This has been a very interesting talk. Um, it is indeed a dire situation, as you mentioned, and it needs, this work is uh, incredibly important to characterize and identify the problem to hopefully um, uh, find solutions. Um, remember that um, for the audience, uh, there is a QA um, uh, button um, in the bottom of the screen. Um, please feel free to leave uh, questions there. Um, and in the meanwhile, um, I wanted to, to ask you, um, Professor Gonzalez de Bustamante, um, from your talk, I gather, there are two main pillars, two main dimensions of the problem. One of them deals with them, with the um, profession of journalism itself. And the other one is uh, linked to the violence in the uh, geographical peripheries of the country of Mexico. Um, it came to mind, um, as you mentioned, the problem is, um, generalized throughout Latin America. Um, I remember um, growing up in Colombia, uh, witnessing the violence um, against journalists, um, very famously of Jaime Garzón in the late, nine, in the late 90s. Um, he was a very critical journalist. Um, and in this pillar, the main problem is in a sense impunity and the sense of um, selflessness, right? And in the other pillar um, regarding geographic, um, the, the violence in the geographic periphery. Um, it also came to mind to me this big problem of the feminicide um, of, of women in the northern parts of the, of the country um, mm -hmm. that worked in sweatshops, you know, that it was um, made famous or infamous by Roberto Olaño in his uh, novels and stories. So my question is, identifying these two pillars um, as you have, how do you see the future for journalism or female journalism in the peripheries um, in, in, in Mexico and in Latin America? Wow. Uh, I think it's with many things, thank you for that question and sort of um, framing those, those pillars. It's a, I think it's going to be in the near future, it's going to continue to be very difficult and challenging. Uh, the, if we just look at the number of, of people killed and who's being killed, it's mostly men, but there have been uh, many women killed as well among the, the more than 150 journalists now killed over the past uh, you know, 21 years. Most of the women have been killed in working in these peripheral areas, um, the one case, where a very prominent journalist, Regina, um, uh, Regina Romero, um, not Regina Romero, I'm sorry, um, Regina, oh, I'm forgetting her last name, excuse me, I'm from Veracruz, was working for a, a prominent publication, a Proceso, but she was still working in the periphery in Veracruz. Um, so that's like one case um, that is a little bit different. I think it's going to be continue to be very challenging. There, the upside is of this for women is um, these networks that have been formed. But women are also we haven't. This is the you know Latinx Digital Center for Latinx Digital Media. The other part of this that we haven't talked about is 
the online situation for women who all people can be targeted uh, and recipients of violence and defamation online, but women have uh, a particular way of receiving that kind of attacks. The, what I'm trying to get at is the attacks tend to be very um, based on gender and much more um, uh, just um, very cruel for, for women. And there is a connection between what happens online and um, maybe what happens physically, you know, that could lead to uh, physical threat and also even death in some cases that has happened in Mexico. So it's, I think to answer your question, Esteban, unfortunately, it's going to continue to be very difficult. Despite, we haven't talked about this, despite the fact that on the federal level and in some cases on the state level, there are many measures put in place to try to protect journalists. For example, there's a federal law and an actual amendment to the constitution making it um, a federal crime to attack a journalist or a human rights worker. But that has not ha had much influence on stemming the crimes against journalists. It's on the federal level. And these crimes against journalists are happen happening on the local level. So they're, again, getting to the question of the periphery. They're um, on the periphery. Why did, what is it about the periphery? We haven't really, I didn't really talk too much about this. The, they are on the periphery geographically, but they're also on the periphery economically in some of the poorer areas of the country. And their, meaning their media outlets then have less resources to devote to uh, providing training, providing decent wages. And then on many of in these many, these uh, geographic peripheries, that's where a lot of the organized crime is happening and where there are high levels of corruption. So I, I think it's, you know, the short answer is going to continue to be very difficult. The, the positive side of this is they're not, journalists are not sitting idly by, and women journalists are not sitting idly by waiting, waiting for things to happen and waiting for the government to do something. They're doing something about it. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, now um, I will um, pass it over to Valerie. Thank you, Esteban. And thank you so much for such an impactful seminar, Professor Gonzalez de Bustamante. I was intrigued by your description as to how systemic problems in Mexican society are being addressed through journalistic networks. And with these mobilizing mechanisms being led by women in many cases, how are gendered power dynamics within these larger institutional systems being challenged by this emerging phenomenon? And building on this notion, what are the larger implications as to how these network hubs are being developed to push for systemic change through journalistic practices? Thank you. Well, uh, that's a big questions. Thank you for that. Um, let me see. Mexico, like many countries around the world, is a patriarchy. Um, and throughout, you know, that we can say that about Latin America in general. So it's, a, it's going to be continue. And this is sort of related to the previous question, I think. I think change moves slowly and um, the gender dynamics, the power dynamics, I will go back to sort of in thinking about how systemic changes and structural changes happen. Really, they happen when the structure itself will allow the change to happen. So it's, um, it's very incremental. It's depending on the system itself, will it, if it will allow that change to happen, unless we have um, you know, revolution or something like that, but that's probably not going to happen, especially with with the journalists. Um, but in terms of the, I want to just 
talk about the first part of your question um, in terms of the systemic change and the, the gender dynamics. I mean, I find it very interesting that in a patriarchal country like Mexico, you have women taking the helm of, of these. And why, why is that? I think it's, it's also connected, the answer is connected to the types of reporting in some cases. This comes from our research, the types of reporting that women do has a lot of the women are working on questions of human rights and social problems and um, you know, victims of violence. So that tended to be in the realm of, of where women journalists were working in Mexico and attacks against journalists, you know, that's a hu basic human rights issue. So I think that explains partly why, why women in particular are, are in that space because they already were in that space. And I don't know, I think there needs to be more research done on this. I'd like to maybe even continue some of this research to see why is it that in this ex extreme cases and extreme environment for journalists, why is it women who are, are doing this? And why women in what is, getting back to what uh, Stefan was bringing up, um, in a, a town that is infamously known because of the um, femicides, the problem of femicides. And so that's where I think being able to be a scholar of this is, is and why research is so important because it, you could say, oh, that, that doesn't even make sense. Why, you know, why in a place where there's so many women being killed that women are taking the helm wouldn't they be in a corner just like trying to survive? But Juarez and Chihuahua itself has a long history, that's where the history comes in, of women being resistant, resistant to um, horrible situations in the country um, or in the state in this case. So even though we can't, and that's where I guess the media come in too, we, we hear about um, the the femicides, but we're not hearing as much about the resistance to it. And and Juarez is, um, I would say, has, is different than many other states in the north and in, in Mexico itself with that history of resistance among all the people, but it, including women. Um, so that's where the, the context of uh, why women in Juarez kind of took took the charge. And also Marcela Turati, I don't know if any of you know who she is. She's a very prominent journalist at the national level, was um, involved in creating Periodistas de a Pie, the, the grassroots journalist organization in Mexico City. And she is from Chihuahua and she had connections with the women in, in Juarez. And so that also helped to develop and strengthen that particular network, which helped the other networks um, as they were being formed in the country. Hopefully that shed some light on your question. Yes, for sure. Thank you so much. Great. Now, um, I'll pass it over to Facundo. Uh, hello. I, I, I don't know. Uh, I kind of start my video, um, but um, I will uh, ask anyway. Thank you very much Celeste Gonzalez de Butamante for this incredible presentation and so insightful presentation as well. Um, I have a, a question about the audience of how, do, how journalists uh, perceive the audience. Um, you know, there is um, a growing uh, scholarship around, uh, and you mentioned when you are, uh, are answering Esteban's uh, question, you mentioned this uh, concept of online harassment, which which is like increasingly uh, being addressed by uh, by many scholars, mm -hmm. um, and and you mentioned that from um, one side we have like these top down uh, powerful actors like uh, 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 attacking and well uh, victimizing uh, journalism, but at the same time these other uh, these other scholarships say that sometimes these harassment come from the bottom-ups uh, come from the audience. So mm -hmm. 
how, how do you see the, this tension like between like powerful actors and 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 like top down violence uh and top uh, and bottom up bottom up uh um uh violence and and if if they find some kind of um in in, in the sources of re uh resistance and 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 uh uh, if if you found that there is a way in which audience can help journalists to uh, to uh, present resistance to some to some powerful actors of how how they perceive their their relationship with their audience, I think that's my question. Thank you very much. That's a great question. Well, you you guys are really um, making me think. So, I. I love this question because there is definitely a relationship between a powerful actors uh, harassing, whether it be online or in person, a journalist and the people, um, everyday people, if you will, uh, maybe even anonymously online attacking journalists. And in some cases, uh, those anonymous thing, attacks could be coming from powerful people as well. But there's certainly a relationship. If you see that the people in power are not being checked, or if there's this level of impunity where people in power can be um, attacking journalists online and nothing happens to them, then of course, as a everyday person, nothing happens to somebody in power that gives me sort of a license to, to do the same thing. Right, and and then we have this. It's connected to uh, sort of populist leaders, uh, also throughout the region, including you know uh, the past um, president. You know, in this, there's a we've we've seen how the, there's a definite relationship between powerful figures and uh, bottom up figures, as using your language, and how this can be detrimental for journalists. Um, how the audience can possibly help with this is, I think, very simply, uh, when these kinds of things happen, uh, what are you going to do as, a, uh, as an everyday person? Are you going to retweet that to uh, increase the level of, you know, rep repeat the, the violence, if you will, online? Or are you going to call it out? Uh, are you going to support journalists? And um, really, the, the question has to do with media literacy as well, and uh, supporting journalists in all kinds of ways and supporting good journalism. So I think that's, that's sort of the short answer of what um, audiences can do is support really good journalism and support journalists and not be get wrapped up in, in part of that, that spiral of a violence that is really happening online sometimes. Thank you very much. Thank you for that question. Now we have a question uh, by Mora. Mora. Oh, I can't hear you, Mora. I think you might be muted. Oh, sorry, that's the classic Zoom mistake. I, I was muted. <laughs> Thank you so much, Professor Gonzalez de Bustamante, for this really important uh, presentation. I do have a question on one of the um, resistance strategies, the ordinary everyday resistance strategies that you mentioned, and that's related to the use of WhatsApp. Uh, mm -hmm. You say that WhatsApp is used instead of common or SMS or text message. Mm -hmm. I wonder what is it about WhatsApp that makes it a technology that journalists prefer when it comes to protecting themselves? from violence. Thank you very much. Thank you. I mean, this is a, a we all know that technology is changing uh, so quickly. And so I think among the people we talked with, there was a sense that in many cases that they were being monitored. In fact, there's some other work, um, uh, Feinstein um, has done work on this and uh, interviewing and Jorge Luis Sierra has interviewed journalists. Many journalists feel that they are being surveilled by dark actors, if you will, could be part of the government or organized crime groups. And so 
the idea that they would be maybe infiltrating their phones um, and text messages, whereas they might have thought that with WhatsApp, there was a little uh, layer of, uh, more layer of protection there. Um, that is not to say that they felt completely protected. Um, so, but for everyday kind of uh, communications, they would, they would use that as opposed to text messaging. And then sometimes they would use, not use their phones at all. They would use two-way radios so that they felt like that was a, a more, that was uh, provided them a little bit more protection, the two-way radio transmissions, because once that transmission is out there, it's gone and, um, and then there's no way to track that. So if I, I think if we were to go back and do again, the same question, I wonder if we would get the same response. And that's why I think it's important to continue to do this research. I think if we continue to um, interview and include journalists in our work, we could see longitudinally if this is still somewhat in practice or if it's another kind of thing that they're doing. And can I take the chance to re-ask about that? Um, mm -hmm. Their social media accounts. You just mentioned that they at times don't use the phone, but the phone is a really important tool for work, for journalistic work. So what about uh, social media? Do you see any trend of you know, resistance to using social media in order to protect themselves, or it's a compromise they need to use them uh, despite of the danger that that in, entails, et cetera. Yeah, that's a great question. We do talk about that in our book in one chapter, um, the use of digital, digital media and social media. And so they're very careful about it. They, they see social media as, uh, very important to their work in terms of maybe gathering sources, but then there's the downside of that is, is possibly exposing sources, exposing themselves. So one thing that they do in particular is if they're at a crime scene, they will not post anything about that on social media until they're completely gone from that location. In fact, they've even provided with these networks that I've been talking about, provided training on how to use social media so that you're not opening yourself up for um, possible attacks and keeping yourself as, as safe as, as possible. Uh, those are just some of the things that they've done in, with respect to social media. Um, some, it's very individual. So some people will just use social media to find information, tracking Twitter, tracking certain hashtags. And then some people are more apt to try to create an audience, getting back to the previous question, Facundo's question, trying to create an audience um, on social media, but others who are sh shying away for the, from that because of the possible um, attacks or increasing in dangers that that might result in. Thank you so much, Professor Celeste. Thank you. Thank you for that question, Mora. And now, finally, I'll pass it over to uh, Pablo. Thank you very much. The, the talk was absolutely excellent and um, very thought provoking. I, um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about geographic sources of variation. So you touched upon gender as an important variable to account for different ways in which these everyday and uh, extraordinary acts of resistance are enacted. Um, and I was wondering whether uh, there were some patterns alongside uh, geographic markers. You showed the significant variance in different parts of the country uh, relative to uh, volume of attacks. Um, uh, there are, I'm assuming, I do not, I'm not an expert on, on this, but they're assuming, I'm assuming there are differences in terms of how the media systems of the different regions are organized. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, there are, we know because you mentioned that there are differences also in sources of violence, in which cartel is in which region, the, the level of the presence, etc. So, did you observe any sort of patterns of variance related to geography as a proxy for these different indicators um, uh, in 
uh, both uh, every day and extraordinary acts of resistance? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think I could answer that in terms of what we found in terms of um, prof levels of professional autonomy. Mm -hmm. So, and by that, I mean um, the ability to, to try to determine uh, what you're going to cover, what your work place is going to look like and so there's the ideal the ideal in, in terms of what the journalists would like their professional workplace and what they want there to be able to cover what they want that to be and the reality and so we're bringing that into uh, the study as well and so in chihuahua is where we find the greatest level of professional autonomy. And this connects to, I think, this uh, question of resistance. That's where, where you see the greatest resistance is, is where you would find the greatest level of professional autonomy in some cases. Um, I will, I'm sort of, it's a complicated thing because this situation is shifting where I would say, you know, earlier on, we found that there was less professional autonomy in a state like Sonora. And at the same time, toward the end of our study period, we found that there was starting to be more resistance and these networks were being created in, in, Juarez, in um, Sonora. So I'm trying to get at this question and bring in the gender related to, to your question. I think it's just so, it's a hard one to, to say if, if, if there's a certain degree of, um, well, none of this is generalizable, but it's, it's shifting so much and it depends on the individual actors, women um, or, or men who are working in these areas. And you're right that there are different media systems within the country. So Veracruz is much more um, dependent on the government, if you will, than for, for funding, and uh, for funding of uh, advertising, and, um, and they have these uh, contracts sometimes, uh, um, sometimes written, sometimes not written, where they're being basically subsidized by the government. So there's a lot less autonomy there, whereas in Baja California, there might be more autonomy because they're, they're not so dependent on the government in terms of, um, of their publication. Like one example I'll give is um, one that is led by women, um, uh, Seta Magazine in Tijuana has a long history of being very independent. In fact, they are so independent that they publish the, the printed version of their, their by weekly uh, in San Diego because there have been cases where they would publish and then you know the government or whoever the bad actors are comes in and takes all of the printed <laughs> copies and you know, then the information doesn't get out. So that's one of the places where there's more professional autonomy and has been for, for a while. So it's, it's really a question of, of the history too of, uh, and how much um, autonomy historically the, the region or the journalists working in those particular regions have had. All right, thank you very much. Uh, this uh, has been a great seminar, very, very important topic. So I want to thank you again for a wonderful presentation. I want to thank Esteban for great introduction and moderation. And I want to thank our audience for staying with us uh, to the end. And I invite everybody to join us for the next uh, installment of uh, the seminar series of the Center for Latinx Digital Media. Goodbye. <laughs>